to reconvene now um, after our break. Thank you so much again to those of you here in the, the audience for joining us. And, uh, and of course, to those online as well for being with us. Uh, I'm Anne Morning. I am a sociologist at NYU. Uh, I study people's conceptualizations of race there. That is their kind of everyday folks' understandings of what race is, yeah. with a particular interest in how discourse coming out of the sciences shapes those ideas. So I'm really thrilled and honored to be part of this, this gathering today. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing what no doubt promises to be a really terrific panel. I'm going to start by just introducing briefly our first speaker, Vince Bonham, who is the deputy director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and he will be giving a presentation entitled Perceptions of Race in the Clinical Encounter. Well, first, I just want to say uh, thank you to the to Wendy and the planning team for the invitation to be part of this great symposium today and to to see so many colleagues and have an opportunity to be part of this discussion. Um, I am not going to give a formal paper uh, as our colleagues before did, but give a presentation and a talk, uh, really exploring 15 years of work uh, focused on the use of race in medicine uh, and the perceptions of healthcare providers uh, with regards to the importance of race. So um, my work um, over the last more than 15 years uh, at the National Human Genome Research Institute has included really studying how healthcare providers think about human genetic variation and race and use it in clinical practice. Uh, and thinking about the use of race has changed over that period of time and thinking about what is happening within the field of medicine. Uh, and the understanding of the conflation of race and ancestry uh, in understanding and clinical decisions and how, uh, the, particularly in the last few years, there's been a focus with regards to clinical algorithms uh, related to race and the importance or the challenges and limitations of use of those. Uh, and then I will argue that within the last uh, six years, we've had a really reckoning within medical education around the use of race um, that is important to today. Um, but if you look back, and uh, my original work, uh, first paper uh, in this area was published in 2009, and actually the work goes back to just at the completion of the Human Genome Project and thinking about um, what does this mean when we have this conversation within the field of genetics and genomics that uh, race doesn't exist um, but providers see race as extremely important with regards to clinical decision making to explore and to understand how physicians and other health professionals uh, think about this work. Um, so I'm going to put my uh, talk today in the context of that original work that we did, where we actually conducted some qualitative work with physicians, all general internists, primary care providers. We made a decision that primary care providers were an important area to study uh, with regards to the use of race in medicine. Uh, and our original work uh, was qualitative, where we conducted focus groups of general internists. Um, we conducted 10 focus groups of uh, self-identified Black or African-American physicians and, and 10 groups of self-identified White American physicians. Uh, and the moderators of those groups were general internists of the same self-identified background. So these are doctors talking to doctors about the use and utility of race in medicine. Uh, and this work, which I did a lot with uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Cheryl Sellers, a sociologist in Miami, Ohio, uh, where we really were seeking to explore understanding of just how race is of utility to physicians uh, in their um, clinical practice. And the major finding of that original qualitative work was this. Both black and white physicians concluded that the race of the patient is medically relevant, but did not agree upon the uh, reason why race is important in the clinical decisions. The black physicians saw race as extremely important for a cultural, social context. 
And the white physicians saw race as important from a biological or genetic context. So we saw this major theme difference in this work, this qualitative work that we conducted uh, in um, 2009 and 2010 to explore these kinds of questions about how um, race is used in the decision making. Um, that work moved forward to actually conduct uh, a national survey of general interest to explore a number of issues to help us think about can we create a measure to assess explicit use of race in clinical care. Uh, and so we conducted a, a study, a national study of general internists, with 787 general internists. And you can see here the demographics of those uh, internists uh, with regards to um, identifying their use of race and developing a assessment tool uh, for the use of race in medicine. Out of that work came a number of, of papers that were important to really kind of question about the relevance of race in medicine. Just a couple of takeaways. This is think race is important in clinical decision making, and they continue to use race in clinical decision making. Uh, but there were some interesting differences that we saw in um, one of the, the sub-projects that we did uh, with Lisa Cooper and Brooke Cunningham uh, was exploring the issues of, of when physicians have uncertainty in their decision how do they use race? And we found that general internists with higher anxiety due to clinical uncertainty report using race in medical decision-making at a higher level than those with lower anxiety due to understanding. So this interesting kind of correlation between uh, concerns around anxiety and the actual use of a race measure that we created that I'll talk about was an interesting finding uh, from this work. We asked a number of questions. So this goes back to the first presentation and defining of race and ethnicity. We asked the physicians uh, in our study is, what does race mean to you? And what does ethnicity mean to you? Two separate questions that we asked. And I just want to highlight here that the vast majority of the physicians in this study identify race as either a genetic ancestral group or a biological group. So over 80% identify race with genetics and biology. And then when we ask the question ethnicity, over 60%, 64% identified ethnicity as a cultural group. Um, I use this slide a lot in a lot of different talks, and it has so many, I think, important uh, messages, uh, I think, when we think about the use of race in clinical practice. One is that these physicians see a difference in these two constructs. But the other one is to think about the medical literature and that so much of the medical literature talks about race and ethnicity or race slash ethnicity and this conflation of these constructs. But then how, when you're interpreting that, when you read the medical literature, of what does that provider think of that finding when that type of conflation is used there. So this recognition of the complexity of these terms when we think about how providers think about difference. We ask the question, does biological difference between racial groups affect health outcome differences? You see that almost all of the physicians agree with that statement. Uh, and so this recognition that they perceive that there are biological differences that are between racial groups and health outcomes. But then we asked a different question, um, and this really, um, I, I felt good about this, and that we didn't see the same identical answer when we said, is race the best proxy clinicians have to identify genetic effects on health? You see a different spectrum of responses um, from these physicians and that there's clearly more of a difference in kind of views and opinions about the uh, importance or whether um, race is the best proxy uh, in clinical uh, effects and genetic effects on health. So out of this work, um, we, and we conducted initially a pilot study of our survey with approximately 350 physicians and then our national survey uh, we created a new measure 
that we call the racial attributes and clinical evaluations measure or the race measure. Uh, Dr. Cheryl Sellers and I are the authors of this measure. Um, and that measure we're now used with other physicians and other types of health professionals. And I wanna talk about that measure. So the measure has seven items to it. Uh, and these are the seven items uh, in the racial attributes and clinical evaluation measure. Uh, they are, I consider information from patients about their racial background. Um, I consider my patient's race to better understand their genetic predispositions. Um, we created this measure both for physicians and nurses, and it's slightly different for nurses, as you can see here uh, on this slide. Uh, so the next is I consider my patient's race when making decisions about medications to prescribe. Um, the next, I consider my patient's race in determining genetic risk for common complex diseases and give them examples of kidney disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, fifth question, I consider my patient's race in making medication dosage decisions. Uh, and I consider my patient's uh, race when determining age of initiation of screening for certain diseases. And the final question, I consider my patient's race in determining how aggressively to treat particular diseases. These are the seven items in the measure that we use to assess race. Um, so this really is a range of, of whether you is a low, moderate, or high use of race as being important with regards to decision making. Now, I just want to just let you know, we frame this race scale that there is not a good response or a bad response. It's to assess the level of use of race in clinical decision making. Um, and we argue that this can be a debate whether the use of race is of utility and of importance or not. Uh, and, but we wanted to make this as an assessment of explicit use of race in clinical decision making. We've now used this uh, measure with a number of different types of providers. You see the original work uh, with the general internist. Uh, you can see the main score, uh, the mean score, excuse me. The range is zero to 28. And you see the mean score uh, in our internist in 2010 was 13.5. Uh, we conducted um, a study with nurse practitioners in 2012. Um, you see that's a higher mean score, and then we can talk about that from a perspective of a number of issues uh, at 15. Um, then primary care residents in 2019, these were both family uh, medicine physicians and uh, general internists, um, but all residents. Uh, and you see the, the mean score of 12.8. And then our most recent work, which was done with family medicine docs um, in 2021, and you see um, 10.6. So we really have been interested in this change over time around these primary care providers, these general internists and family medicine docs with regards to their reported explicit use of race. And you can see here that we did see a significant difference uh, over time that exists, uh, which also can be based on specialty. So there is the issue, is, is this specialty, is this time, what is going on with regards to this change? Um, but I wanna highlight one item in our questions is that there was one item that there was no change. The item that did not reveal a significant difference between general interns and family medicine physicians was I consider information from patients about their racial background. So this continued um, importance of patients' racial background in the providers' clinical decision-making and care of their patients. And so this is, I think, an important statement of looking over this 15-year period that race continues to be important in clinical decision-making and in clinical care. So let me now look forward to today. And, and, and this is work from 2022 and 2023 um, that we've conducted. Uh, and uh, the most recent use of the race scale was with family medicine doctors in collaboration with Dr. Oka, who is an assistant professor at University of Minnesota, uh, where we looked at and used the race scale. But we also had a couple other questions about the physician's beliefs. We asked what, what are the what are the reasons why you see differences 
health disparities and differences? Is it genetic variation? Is it cultural difference? Is it social conditions? So taking the question of their beliefs about why we see differences um, with regards to health outcomes, as well as the explicit race measure that we created. And we saw both for those positions that believe the causes of these disparities is genetic variation, as well as cultural differences had higher race scores. And those that said that the cause of these differences were social conditions actually had lower race scores. So this was an interesting finding of this connection between the beliefs of the provider and the reported use of race. So I want to just put some context that I think is really important when we talk about um, race in medicine, that I actually think what has happened over the last four years is uh, really a change in conversations. We have authors in the room who wrote very, very important papers that came out in 2020 during COVID, uh, the quote, racial reckoning, the, the murder of George Floyd, all the things that were happening in our country. Um, but that there was a lot going on in medicine and particularly from medical students and residents challenging the use of race in medical education. Uh, and this was both in the medical literature, in the scientific literature, in the conversations, uh, and in Congress um, that were, were questioning professional societies about how they were using race, race, racial algorithms, and clinical care. And so there was this conversation that has happened around the appropriateness of race in medicine and, and the work by um, Dr. Baez and Dr. Jones here uh, hidden in plain sight that it's gotten cited in so many studies in so many places, really kind of explores this issue of challenging. Um, do we need to rethink how uh, clinical algorithms use race and race correction and understanding that? And I think so. I think that there's a clearly a shift that's happening here. And one of the things that I think we need to do is we need to study that shift. And the study is that change occurring within clinical decision making and how race is influencing um, um, activities within clinical care. Um, and so that has led to the most recent work that we have that's ongoing uh, within my research group. I'm working with Dr. Anitra Prasad, who's a, a resident here at Penn uh, and was a former fellow in my lab, um, one of my current uh, post baccalaureate fellows. Um, where we have a study, which is a qualitative study, uh, examining the use of race in clinical practice that's ongoing. And the objective of this study is to evaluate the perceptions of three distinct physician groups, cardiologists, obstetricians, gynecologists, and pathologists, towards the utility of race correction within routine clinical testing and assessment. Uh, we've collected the data um, on this. Uh, these were semi-structured interviews with 30 uh, physicians, 10 from each subspecialty, um, and that our work is ongoing. Um, so I am not able to provide you kind of um, final analysis, but I want to share with you some quotes um, from this work. Uh, and just to give you context of thinking about what I call today, um, thinking about the last uh, couple of years and what these physicians uh, had to say. So we asked the question, how do you collect race and ethnicity information about your patient? And these are a couple of the quotes. Oftentimes, it's just from us looking at the patient, the physician license. I kind of guess what they fit. Now that I think about it, I feel like, you know, that's sort of like something that maybe I should change in my practice. <laughs> maybe that I should ask the patient instead of just look at them and kind of decide what it is and just plug it in. But yeah, that's how I've been doing it. And this was in the conversation around the clinical algorithms and race correction that this conversation uh, was occurring. Another physician, in terms of inputting the race variable, I would, if I was doing it in the room, the patient, like during the discussion, I would ask them. But if I was doing it prior to going into the room or like afterwards, I would either look at the chart or just make, I hate to say this, but like make my own assumptions about the appearance of the patient. Another question we asked, 
What is the relationship between race and genetic ancestry? Race is more or less referring to a group of kind of people who share some sort of similar ancestry. So they're kind of more have similar genetic features. Yeah. So race and genetics kind of correlate, but like really race is like where I geographically where you're from. So I, I give you just these quotes um, to, to say um, there have been a lot of changes, but there have not been changes <laughs> over the period of time of my work. Um, and so going back to the original focus groups that I talked to you about that were in 2008, 2009, and the conversation, and then we go to this conversation that we have with, with physicians in 2022 and 2023, there's a lot of similarities here um, around um, race in the context of race uh, within the clinical encounter. Uh, and part of the work that uh, Cheryl and I worked on over this 15 year period is trying to, to set a, a framework for thinking about race in the clinical encounter and what we call a racial lens of clinical decision making. Um, and this you know, goes back to early in our work where we, we thought that it was important to think about this from a framework perspective. And, and this figure here is, is our framework of, of the various domains that go into clinical decision-making from the background characteristics of the provider uh, and the patient and the interaction of those and how they can all play an important role, uh, the physician's knowledge about genetics and genetic variation and their beliefs about genetics and genetic variation and their understanding of race and how that is different based on the life experiences, the age, the kind of environment that the provider comes from. Um, the patient, the patient brings things to the table uh, with regards to the context of their social identity and who they are and their experiences with the healthcare system and what does that mean around race and racial discrimination and their perceptions of how they may be perceived within a clinical decision making and what happens in that, that interpersonal relationship of the provider and the patient in that clinic and how that influences decisions and ultimately the physician's interpretation of information and, and then clinical decision. But we say there's what we call the seventh domain, which is this racial lens, that race is always there. It could be a positive, a negative, or it could be neutral, but it exists in the clinical environment. And so there's a racial lens to clinical decision making that exists. Um, and, and we must study that and understand that better to assess it, both for medical education, uh, both for the appropriateness um, in clinical care. So I'm going to come to an end in my talk here, uh, and I want to frame a question that can be part of our conversation. Will changes in the use of race and genomics impact the use of race? Uh, and um, with two members of the National <laughs> Academy's uh, consensus study in the room, uh, as well as uh, uh, just a great committee that uh, worked hard and published in March of 2023 uh, this report that I'm sure everyone who is in the room and is on this uh, Zoom call is familiar with. And if you are not, I encourage you to, to QR code it and go to it and read it because it's important to our symposium today. Um, and I think that I would argue we are um, at an important uh, reflection point within genetics and genomics research. Um, and as I mentioned to Anne before we started, I think studying that report and studying over time, do we see change within uh, the field of genetics and genomics uh, research and how race is used will be extremely important um, because I argue that this is a seminal report uh, and that you'll see policy changes that influence what scientists do. 
Uh, and I just want to highlight just one recommendation that researchers should not use race as a proxy for human genetic variation. Um, one of the 13 uh, recommendations that's there. Uh, but I, I use that to think about my work around um, how physicians and other health professionals think about and use race in clinical decision making. And will what's happening within genomics influence what happens in patient care? And um, this is clearly something that um, we all need to think about in different ways. And uh, there is another National Academies report that's going to be coming out. Uh, we'll see what that has to say and its recommendations. Um, but it's an interesting conversation that you now have, um, you know, basic scientists, uh, you know, social scientists, population scientists, uh, challenging our um, uses of population descriptors in a way that medical uh, researchers don't. Uh, and are there ways that we will learn from what is happening there that actually makes change? So, you know, here in, in one of the, the big debates around the consensus study re recommendations is around genetic similarity and the appropriateness of using that, um, you know, different ways to describe populations. Um, but actually, will, will this kind of construct of genetic similarity actually get integrated into clinical decision making? And if so, how? And will it only be around a certain screening and assessments, or will it be around the social context of what happens in a clinical encounter, or what will happen there? So I think that's a lot for us to, to think about and to study um, around how what is happening within um, the field of genomics will influence medicine uh, over the next uh, 10 years or so. So I just want to have a quick plug of an advertisement for everyone uh, before I end um, that on May 28th and May 29th, uh, the National Institute of Health, uh, it's uh, kind of seven different institute centers and offices are holding a workshop, uh, Population Descriptors for Legacy and Genomic Data, Challenges and Future Directions. It's focused on legacy data and population descriptors, uh, recognizing that there are numerous um, databases, studies that have been conducted um, that are not um, new and, and changing how population descriptors are used, but are historical. How, how do we use those and communicate those in a way that is more nuanced uh, and appropriate uh, for where we are in 2024? So I encourage you to, to come to this virtual workshop, to register for it, um, and uh, to attend and participate, uh, because I think this is an important part of the ongoing conversation that's happening about how to consider um, the consensus study report and how it's influencing um, the future of genetics and genomics research. Uh, so with that, I just want to acknowledge um, some of my colleagues who are part of the research that I shared and presented today, and um, my, um, my colleague who helped uh, me in thinking about this talk today. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Vince, and thank you very much for the publicity for the NASA committee that Dorothy and I have the, the honor of serving on. Um, I'm so pleased now to introduce to you our second speaker, Janet Bushim from the University of California, San Francisco, will be presenting a talk entitled, Maybe They'll See Me as Less Than What I Am, Institutional Trustworthiness and the Continued Salience of Difference as Inequality. Oh, thank you. So 